What's next doesn't happen by accident. It doesn't happen by chance. What's next happens when experience meets expertise, when data meets dollars, and when steel meets earth. What's next happens when the promising work of pioneer state-of-the-art research centers meets the unsparing challenges of more than 17,000 on-farm trials. Our ultimate goal is to bring the next seed breakthrough to your fields. Because Pioneer isn't just our name, it's our mission. Pioneer. What's next happens here. It's time for Real Egg Radio on Rural Radio Channel 147 on Sirius XM. Radio and RealEggCulture.com is your home for insight and analysis of the issues that are impacting your farm business. Let's get real and get connected with Real Ag Radio. Welcome to Real Ag Radio here on Rural Radio 147, Sirius XM. Sean Haney, your host here on this Thursday edition of the show. Hey, thanks so much for making Real Ag Radio and Rural Radio 147 a part of your workday. Greatly appreciate you being here, as well as everybody that's downloaded the Real Ag Radio podcast wherever you get your podcasts. Okay, Farmer Rapid Fire brought to you by Pioneer Seeds Canada. For more than 90 years, Pioneer has developed and tested products to meet your local challenges. With new Optimum Glide Canola, Enlist E3 Soybeans, to performing corn products and industry-leading traits and technologies, to maximizing your yield potential. Pioneer's on-the-ground teams can help you get the right products for your fields. Visit pioneer.com slash Canada to learn more. More And speaking of on-the-ground teams, we're going to hear today from Mark Mazenouve, who is in the Ottawa area. He's a Territory Manager and Crop Protection Specialist with Corteva. He will be our guest today as part of the Farmer Rapid Fire. The farmers that we're going to talk to today, we've got a great list of wily veterans of the show, providing insight for quite some time. we got uh, Chris Bauer, who's in Lakeland, North Saskatchewan. we got Chad Beagle, who's in Rimby, Alberta. Ryan Barrett is in PEI, and we've got Warren Schneckeberger, who is out in Morrisburg, Ontario. So a great group of farmers. We've got livestock, we got crops, we got well, Ryan Barrett's an expert in potatoes, so we got a lot of ground here to cover today on Real Ag Radio. Now, if the way that you participate, you don't need to wait to be on the Farmer Rapid Fire to provide me with an update on what's happening in your farm. You can always email me, shaney at realagriculture.com. You can have also, of course, uh, follow us across all the different social media platforms. Or if you so choose, you can always call the Real Ag Feedback Line, 855 776 6147. So much feedback to get to, so little time. Got an email here from Jerry. He's responding to, we put a story up about about weather predictions and old wives' tales, so to speak, and, and the myth and legends of weather. Jerry says, my dad used to write it on the calendar religiously, and I do it the odd time for fun. I think Jerry's referring to fog and rain. I think dad did it for the mere hope that it would rain. My problem is that Peter Phillips and Environment Canada is not much more accurate than the fog myth. He talks down the about the folk, folklore, but his 90-day predictions are useless as well. Phillips has some credibility in telling me what's on the other side of the hill that I can't see anything more than that. It's a myth as well. So Jerry, not a fan of Environment Canada. I think it's David Phillips, but uh, yeah, it's uh, and there's a lot of criticism of the weather person and their ability or lack thereof to tell the weather 90 days out. As, as as well. So uh, go to realagriculture.com and you can vote in this week's poll. We'll be right back with Farmer Rapid Fire brought to you by Pioneer Seeds Camp. CDC Endure is a new oat line from Alliance Seed. High yielding with excellent disease resistance and the quality end users ask for all in one great oat variety. CDC Endure provides the high beta-glucan levels to make heart-healthy products like breakfast cereals. For more information on CDC Endure Oats, as well as any other products from Alliance Seed, check out allianceseed.com or visit any Alliance Seed authorized retailers. When it comes to your farm, you demand performance, because what goes in determines what comes out. 
At Pride Seeds, we deliver on performance. With best-in-class corn hybrid seed, you'll see results when it comes to premium yield in all the ways that matter. Moisture, nutrition, dollars per acre, and of course, tonnage. So discover your farm's advantage, the Pride Seeds Advantage. Visit your local dealer or prideseeds.com today. Introducing the Arion 600 Series Tractor by Kloss, where versatility meets productivity head on because you've got jobs to do. Mowing, tedding, raking, baling, loading, filling, tilling, cleaning, spreading, hauling, feeding. This is multi-purpose reimagined to do the work for you. It's more than just power. The Arion 600 Tractor gets it done. And we start off this week's Farmer Rapid Fire. We're going in the reverse order here this week. We're going to start in Alberta. We're talking to Chad Beagle, who is in Rimby, Alberta. Hey, Chad, how's it going? Good. How are you, Sean? Pretty good. Well, you know, I, yeah. I, I, I can't start asking about what's going on in the feed store or in the pasture. I, you all set for hockey season with all your kids? Yeah, finally, I think we are. Yes, you betcha. We, we've we got uh, uh, a two-and-a-half-hour triangle here. So I got one son in, in Canmore playing for the AJ team there and another son in Drumheller. And then my daughter just recently made the uh, Red Deer uh, U15AA team. So we're finally set. And uh, uh, one thing about it, I get to see the country and, and down Highway 22 and down Highway 21 and, and uh, get a good lay of the land anyway. Yeah, no no kidding. Get used to that winter <laughs> driving. Absolutely. Okay, so how are things looking in your parts from a, from a I guess, let's, you know, you're, you're ranching, you got some pasture. How's everything looking? It, it, you know, it's looking okay. Uh, there, it's it's spotty. It's spotty, definitely. But for the most part, you know, uh, we had decent enough early rain to get the crops going. Uh, the hay crops and the grass pasture did suffer a bit. Um, we did get a moisture here, a little bit of moisture here recently, which helped. Uh, not quite enough, but I think it's going to get guys at least into October before they got to open up the the feed so yeah it, it, it's okay the crops i know just talking to customers at the store um uh, surprisingly i think overall everybody's pretty surprised with the with the yields and stuff which is a good thing um i know with the amount of rain we had it was you know i think going into it people were a little skeptical of what the yields were going to be but uh overall i think we got rains at the right time for the crops so uh overall i think uh, uh guys are pretty pretty surprised and pretty happy in your area there not typically like when i think of some of the dry spots of alberta i do i do not think of of rimby um, no. so this is kind of unusual is it not yeah i i think so over the last couple of years absolutely um uh, usually we we typically get quite a bit of early spring moisture which gets everything going and and with the grass and the hay uh this year you know just like everywhere else she was she's pretty hot but uh like i said i i think for the most part we got rains at the right time for the crops so um you know pretty like i said everybody's seems to be pretty pretty happy with how things are going through harvest so around the feed store i know people come in for coffee and there's lots of chit chat and you you you're probably the little bit uh you you know all the gossip of uh, the <laughs> yeah. local area i am sure uh, yeah. what's the expectation of the fall run like as in price wise just how are how are people looking at oh, it and thinking the cattle about it? and stuff yeah, yeah no people are yeah no it's uh it's looking really good actually uh you know the calves have been selling really high like higher than you know just about like historic numbers so it's it's a that is a saving grace for sure uh i know people you know hay prices are we're skyrocketing. I think that's starting to settle down a little bit more now. Guys are starting to get some second cut off, and which is helping. And and the silage crops were good. So uh, as far as the the cattle goes, I I hope that uh, people have kind of got their feedstocks kind of an idea of it anyway. And uh, hopefully, we kind of for the for the local guys, the smaller guys, that the the hay prices continue to kind of settle down a little bit for sure any discussion in that area with feed stocks being reasonable any any talk of 
heifer retention or stuff just going to town because the prices are so good? I think that's the, the typically that's what I'm hearing. Um, you know the and and unfortunately in the last two years we have seen you know the few dispersals and guys uh, you know the older fellas that have been in it forever and worked their butts off all those years. I think. Uh, you know, instead of buying the, the expensive hay, and unfortunately, they're talking about taking their cows to town to try to, you know, uh, hope that the calf prices kind of carry on into the uh, into the bread cow and and bread, the bread cow market. So, yeah, yeah. Do, do do you see in that area a, a lot of pasture getting ripped up still, and people putting in crop, or what? What what's that sort of? Yeah, no, that that's definitely a thing here for sure. Uh, absolutely, you, the, the, every year you do you do see a few more quarters getting uh, taken off the off the grass market for sure, and and turned into crops. Yeah. Uh, I know when we first moved up here twenty years ago to now, it, yeah, a pretty big difference. Absolutely, has it been twenty years? Uh, it, Twenty-three, actually. <laughs> it's been unreal. How the heck is that possible? Yeah, no, I know. We, uh, you know, it was a hard thing for us to, you know, to pack up. The, we loved the community of Loman, but, uh, you know, it just, uh, the way things work, and, and we were wanted to get a little bit more into the cattle, so that's the move we made, and, yeah, it's unbelievable that it's been that long. I will guarantee you one thing. Your pasture conditions in Rimby <laughs> are exceptionally better than your pa- the pasture conditions as they exist right now in Lomond, Alberta, and across basically most of Southern Alberta, it's not good. Yes, no, I, and we keep in good contact with with a lot of people, and and uh, it's kind of nice too. Like uh, we've got some connections off the boys' hockey teams, that we've got some some farmers and ranchers from Lethbridge and Gleeson, and and so on and so on. So you know, obviously, uh, a lot of the talk you know uh, originates around that, and and uh, yeah, you, you kind of. I know they always ask, you know, how things are up here, and you, you, you know, you do feel a little, little bad about what the conditions that they're dealing with, for sure. You know, that is, you just sort of a whole bunch of memories ripping through my head in terms of like, you know, you go to the hockey tournament, you know, the parents always, well, what room are we going to? And if you know, depending on the hotel, sometimes you can gather in a, they're they're nice enough to give you a room and somewhere around the lobby to uh, to socialize a bit, but. Those could be real special experiences, kind of learning from because in a small community, a lot of times everybody is in agriculture, right? And it, it's it yep. can kind of be a real special time in your life. Oh, absolutely is. I, we can like I haven't got to meet a lot of the Canborn parents quite yet. We're hoping to do that soon. But the the Drumheller uh, group and organization has just been uh, as far as that goes. They really key in actually on recruiting a lot of the boys that are from the rural area, smaller town guys, they, you know, with their character and the, and the work ethic, not to say, take anything away from the, the bigger centers, but that's what drum Heller has really, uh, you know, tried to promote these last few years. And it, and to meet the, the parents, like I said, the Ewells from Gleeson and the Piggins that used to be in that. And then the, uh, the Henderson's from Lethbridge. It's, it's really special for sure. It's kind of funny how that still exists. Like that's still a thing. Like yeah. when you and I were kids, we've known each other our whole lives. That that, that was a thing, and it, that and that those character sort of traits still they still because there's a lot of farm kids that aren't very farm kid, right? So, yeah. but uh, there is still a lot that are. Oh, one hundred percent, and 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 not to take. Oh, sorry, and it's from Strathmore too. You know, you can see it in their play and again i'm not taking anything away from from the from the larger center people but you can just see it at, in their play just that hard gritty work ethic and the boys that are they're willing to do anything to help a teammate and i think honestly i think that comes from small town rural communities and and willing to do anything they can for the guys sitting beside them and i see it on the ice all the time absolutely yeah, that's really, really interesting. Hey, Chad, thanks so much for joining us here today on the Farmer Rapid Fire. Really do appreciate it. All the best to you, and we'll chat with you a bit uh, closer to wintertime, okay? You betcha. My pleasure. Sounds good, Sean. When we come back here on the Farmer Rapid Fire, brought to you by Pioneer Seeds Canada, we've got another stop in Western Canada, and then we'll head out east. You're listening to Real Life Radio, Rural Radio 147. What's next for your fields? At Pioneer, delivering industry-leading genetics drives everything we do. From the scientists in the lab 
to our local teams with boots on the ground. We are determined to get there first. Developing top-performing products, proven in more growing conditions than ever before. Pioneer. What's next happens here. Visit pioneer.com slash Canada to learn more. You know, there's a reason we call it the corn school. Videos on everything from planter setup, weed control, field trial results, yield strategies, and so much more. The Corn School on realagriculture.com has the information and advice you need to help you succeed. Brought to you by Pride Seeds and BSF, Corn School episodes are available at cornschool.com, from realagriculture.com, or as a podcast from your favorite streaming service. Download the latest podcast today. Kosha sucks. Big time. I hate it. Really gets in the way. Awful. But not anymore. Get a head start on tough-to-kill weeds like kochia this fall with Volterra Easy and Fierce Easy Soil Active Herbicide. Apply after harvest before freeze-up for up to eight weeks of extended control in pulses, soybeans, and wheat next spring. Volterra Easy, Fierce Easy for f***ing kochia. Visit newfarm.ca forward slash kochia. Up next, we take the Farmer Rapid Fire, brought to you by Pioneer Seeds Canada, to Lake Lenore, Saskatchewan, and we're talking to Chris Bauer. Hey, Chris, how's it going? Hello. I'm doing good. Hey, it's great to chat with you. Okay, Chris, what's happening this week on the farm? You you rolling through the field in that combine? Yes, uh, we're actually down to just a couple of days left of canola at the combine, and then we'll be done. Overall, harvest has gone actually very well, and... Uh, you know, when, our, when, when the weather improved, when we were doing the cereals, we got rain every time, but for the canola harvest, it actually went really well. So. Have the yields been around your expectations, or has there been any surprises? You know, actually, we were surprised with almost all of our crops. We were quite dry all year and, and warm, and uh, we had some pretty low expectations just because of the way some things looked. But overall, our crops averaged out to be pretty much just a little bit above average. So we can't complain about that. Okay. So when do you think you're going to have it all wrapped up? Well, we should be, I think we have a two days of combining if everything goes well. And then we've got, you know, a bunch of fall work to do for tarrowing and uh, fixing up some patches and stuff like that. Probably some water drainage projects. But uh, overall for harvest, you know, just a couple of days. And uh, we're just waiting on some of these oil seeds to, cut, to dry down. How, how in need are you of... Because one of the things I've been talking about is like, okay, let's get harvest completed for the majority of Western Canada and then let the rain come. Is, is that kind of how you're feeling here this fall? Yes, for sure. I think that's any fall we're like that. Um, you know, even through canola harvest, I don't think people will turn away too much of a rain. Because all of a sudden you're combining along and it gets to be very dry. But uh, I think for the most part, we just, as farmers, we want to get the crop in and then we could use a good soaking of rain. And, uh, well, to your question, how much? Um, you know, we did get about four inches of rain this August, which is more than usual than what we would have in August. But we would take lots of rain if it would come. There's no question about that. Yeah. You, you mentioned harrowing. Are, are you trying to spread trash, trying to get some growth on the weeds? What, what are you trying to accomplish there? Uh, yeah, for the most part, um, we're not really too worried about trash. We have red across choppers on our combine. Um, the, so we're, we're trying to level the fields for next year. We're harrowing the sprayer tracks because there's quite a bit of sprayer tracks, uh, you know, when you're doing uh, fusarium timing or just in the canola around the headlands or whatever as well as yeah it, it, you get the seed mix into the top layer a little bit and get things germinated and hopefully they freeze off before winter yeah do you, do you do a bunch of fall weed control then yeah pretty much everything gets a fall path of something whether it's in crop uh, uh, pre-harvest desiccation or pre-harvest glyphosate or something like that or you know um a lot of our canola acres get done just right before freeze up uh, in preparation to do cereals the next year. Yeah. yeah. Not to turn this into a Redicop commercial, but uh, talk about some of the benefits uh, and, and how long you've been, been using that on the combine. 
Right. So we, we actually were a very early adopter on one of our combines. We run Case Age combines and uh, the farm show, farm progress, I believe. Um, oh, it's got to be, I want to say, seven years ago, maybe even more. We stopped at the booth at the Redicop and we knew that we had some, uh, the, the weaker chopper inside our, uh, our, our factory case combine. And we decided to buy one for one combine. And we couldn't believe the difference it made and quickly purchased another one for the other combine the following year. And uh, we're really, it, it has worked really well for us, just the, the quality of the chop and the, and the length that it can spread the full width of the combine has greatly reduced our headache in almost every other aspect of the farm. Okay, so to talk about the headache reduction. What, 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 give me an example. Well, we just have the standard choppers on our combine, so we would get a lot of long pieces of straw still unchopped coming out the back. And then, you know, if you were doing any kind of tough straw, barley, meats, or, or oats or whatever, it was green and it just wouldn't chop and uh, or spread properly. So you'd have to harrow it. And maybe you'd have to harrow it twice, a heavy harrow, wait for a hot day. And then usually you'd have to run over it, you know, in the spring before seeding so that you could go through it with your mid-row banders. And so now we get, you know, if there's pieces that are three to four inches long at most, that's all it is. And it's, it's mostly just really fine chopped powder and it's uh, residue management has, has greatly increased. And we, we, we see the benefits all through the, all the seasons with that. Oh, awesome. Okay. Thanks for sharing your experiences there. Now, I can't remember if you mentioned this or not, but uh, are you a fall fertilizer guy or spring? Uh, we we sometimes do NH3 in the fall on some of our rented land that's furthest away, uh, just depending on the prices and the moisture that we have. Um, but we do most of our, our 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 fertilizer one pass in the spring with the drill. And I don't think that I'm going to be doing any fall fertilizer this year. Now, is that an agronomic decision, or are you maybe just just delaying the trying to figure out the purchase of, of fertilizer what, what's your thoughts there if you can uh, let us into the decision yeah so i didn't get the best price for my for some of my fertilizer and i still haven't purchased it all yet and that's probably uh, a little bit on me and my retailer just not being able to secure the product but you know having said that um you know i'm not i i didn't really make all my decisions with where stuff is going right now so we didn't have a uh, a solid plan, but you know, usually right after harvest, we kind of put our heads down and, and kind of make a new plan and see what we're going to do. Um, but uh, for the most part, it's it's more of a, a price standpoint. If, if whatever the dollar cents makes sense, but you know, moisture in these last couple of falls, we have been drier, so we have been doing a little bit less of that. Uh, we will probably spread all of our sulfur uh, in the fall with the floater. And maybe even some potash all depends on how that works out. But uh, and that's kind of our, our general plan yeah. is to spread out a little bit like like that. What what do you find more difficult? The decision on when and you know what to do with your crop marketing or the procurement of inputs like fertilizer and diesel? Well, well that's a good question. Um, um I think still I think there's more money left on the table with your grain marketing than there is on the input. Um, yeah, okay, so you can you could have got a little bit under $600 a ton urea, and you know, as, as you probably know, that it shot up to you know almost $800 a ton there in a, in a quick order. And I just think that a lot of people were buying at the time and the suppliers couldn't couldn't give it to us. So, well, does, does that matter? Yeah, I mean, if you, if you save 5,000 acres and you're spending $200 more a ton, well, that does add up. I'm not going to argue, but you know, if you can make a dollar or two extra on fifty thousand bushels of canola, you know, I think that's that's probably the more risk there with your grain marketing than your crop input. Yeah, great, great thoughts and perspectives, Chris. Hey, Chris, thanks so much for joining us here today on the Farmer Rapid Fire. Really appreciate it. I know you're busy trying to finish up harvest and making some time for us. So, all the best to you, and uh, we'll chat with you as we get into the winter time. Okay. Yeah, that's no problem, John. Thanks for having.
When we come back on Real Light Radio, we'll continue the farmer rapid fire as we head out east. We're going to have a stop in PEI as well as Ontario. We'll be right back on Real Light Radio, brought to you today by Pioneer Seeds Canada. Dedication. Watching the sunset over your crop is one of life's simple pleasures. The anticipation of it all. We know that feeling. Introducing our new Airflex NXT, our best honeybee header yet with the closest cut ever. Light, fast reacting, and infinitely adjustable. More yield, less time, and work. Airflex NXT focuses on the future. What drives your next? Visit honeybee.ca or contact your nearest honeybee dealer. The Advancing Women Conference, the National Leadership Conference for Women in Ag, is celebrating 10 years of bringing women in ag together. Whether you're a producer, student, entrepreneur, representative of Grower Association, or corporate agribusiness, invest in yourself in Niagara Falls on November 19th, 20th, and 21st. Visit advancingwomenconference.ca for more information and to register. We take the farmer rapid fire brought to you by Pioneer Seeds Canada, and we are stopping in Morrisburg, Ontario, and our guest is Warren Schneckenberger. Hey, Warren, how's it going? Hey, Sean. Going great. Okay. I, I want to get to harvest and how things are looking and the crop conditions and all that, but I think we got to start off. On, on Monday's show, on Agronomic Monday, Peter Johnson was a guest, and I know you take serious issue with the fact that Johnson admitted that he does not have a chaff spreader. What, what do you think of that? I was appalled, you know, <laughs> Mr. B promoting every BMP under the sun doesn't have a chaff spreader. I texted him immediately after I heard his interview and suggested that he should seriously consider getting one. <laughs> yeah. Now, um, do you obviously have one? Talk about some of the differences and the benefits. Well, I mean, it's, uh, it's a pretty low hanging fruit. You know, we, we all know that Peter loves his wheat and, uh, you know, residue spreading on the soybeans or edible beans ahead of winter wheat's kind of the lowest of hanging fruits for wheat establishments. You, he should know better. So, uh, <laughs> you know, spread, spreading that crop out. And then and even after the wheat, uh, a lot of challenges with corn falling because that, uh, that residue, the real windrows, uh, if you can get that, that chaff spread, it's a lot, lot better for you. Uh, yeah. I think Peter needs to spend some money. Yeah, exactly. He's too cheap. Too cheap. Abs- too absolutely. Cheap. Okay, Warren, how are crops looking? Things are looking pretty good, John. Um, winter wheat was uh, above average. Not as good as last year, but last year was bonkers good, so we can't really use it as a benchmark. But uh, I'm actually standing in a field of pioneer corn right now, and uh, we're about five to ten days behind. But uh, looks like Mother Nature's going to bless us with a wide-open fall. So, uh Things uh, things should progress nicely. But was there a point where you were a little bit more concerned about the the ability for this corn to finish, or is it just kind of a matter of time and Mother Nature just needs to cooperate? Uh, the first part of September, uh, we didn't see the sun very much. The smoke seems to have dissipated coming out of Quebec, which is good, but we did have a lot of overcast weather, and we really need sun to get this uh, these kernels to fill out. We have a real good potential on the corn and beans, for that matter. But uh, without sun, but it looks like now our forecast has changed. Seems to be some heat up in the north, I guess, that's pushing a uh, little warmer temperatures down to us, which is a weird thing to say, but that's what the weather's doing. And uh, looks like we might make it almost Thanksgiving now. So I think we should see uh, some good test weight on the corn and the beans should all finish naturally without a frost. So that, that's good news. Yeah, absolutely. So you, you figure you got enough moisture in, in August to really get those beans to have that fill you're looking for? No, we had, we had a very wet August here, mm. uh, pretty well an inch to two inches of rain a week kind of thing. Oh. Um, well above average. And Warren, then, uh, that, Warren that is, I'm so jealous. A, an inch <laughs> to two inches. Well, it's getting to the point where the tiles for a little while couldn't keep up. So, uh, you know, well, <laughs> farmers will complain about anything, right? Yeah. Do, do you have some untiled ground? <laughs> a little bit, yes. Yeah, we, uh, well, the Alberta sends 
quite a bit of its natural gas and oil through a big chunk of my farm. So we have some uh, areas landlocked by the pipeline that we can't get tiled. So we, we do our best there. We just can't get through that wall of steel with tile. But uh, for the most part, everything's pattern tiled. And, and when you look at the differences in the productivity of that land from untiled to tiled, when you're getting an inch to two inches a week, I'm assuming that you can, like if you put those two crops side by side, you can really see the dramatic differences just visually. Oh, very much so. Um, more so if we have a wet spring, because you just don't get in on undrained land on time. This year we had a dry spring, so things did establish well. And actually some of those untiled fields might uh, yield better than you'd think. Do you get some cover crops? But if you, you, oh, sorry, go ahead. Uh, but if uh, if you don't get it established, absolutely, you're talking almost 100 bushel difference on corn and probably 20 or 30 on soybeans. Who hundred so bushel quite, difference? Quite significant. That that, uh, that adds up very fast. You can do the math quite yeah. easily, everybody. Well, big big areas of zero hurt your average pretty pretty bad. <laughs> yeah, yeah. How about cover crops? You got cover crops? A little bit. Um, we decided to go the land improvement route after winter wheat this year so we 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 ended up doing actually some real aggressive tillage and some uh land forming with a blade but uh ordinarily we would put a a, probably an oats cover crop after wheat and uh i would typically we intercede cereal rye into our corn which would be no-tilled in the soybeans next year but we had i mentioned we had a fairly uh wet summer um our corn grew ridiculously tall lots of 10 to 12 13 foot corn and for past experience uh you can establish a cover crop in the corn but uh it gets smothered after harvest with all that residue and uh, the roi gets pretty fuzzy at that point that's so i've been hearing this a lot that the corn is very tall this year what yeah what led to that uh, we just had fantastic growing conditions through late June, early July. We had a lot of heat. We were many days uh, getting about that 26, 27 heat units, and uh, we had ample moisture. So the corn really was loving life. We had a good start, at least on my farm. We had excellent stand establishment, and uh, corn took advantage of uh, what Mother Nature sent its way. Yeah. It, the should correspond you know if we're getting good we have a good expectation on grain yield and we got a lot of material there the silage corn must have done fairly well this year i would think well like i mentioned we're about 10 days behind so corn silage is just getting started here um it's still i don't think it'll be full bore for another week likely there's a few folks that are out doing the odd outside of fields and absolutely i'd say tonnage is going to be uh, extremely high i think matching stock moisture to grain uh, moisture is going to be a challenge for some producers because i i think uh the plants because they're quite green still and healthy and it's getting quite late you know or the 20th of september roughly i think and uh you know typically silage would be off by now but i think moisture is going to stay higher as grain dries down. So kernel processor is going to be real important, I think. You got a bunch of fall weed control to do this year? Uh, yes, actually. Um, we're going to, uh, typically we don't. We will after winter wheat recover crops, after wheat, just keep things a little easier for corn next year. But I'm actually going to do my very best to do headlands and stuff on my bean ground ahead of corn. We've been uh have struggling with dandelions in the oh. spring. They just get real big. And uh, actually, I, I really enjoyed uh, the agronomist there a week, maybe two weeks ago on fall wheat control, learned a few things, going to try and implement. But that can be a challenge here with, uh, you know, we are certainly warmer than you are in Lethbridge, but uh, keeping a sprayer not winterized in November can be a challenge. But I, I'm going to make it work. <laughs> yeah, you know, I appreciate you bringing up the agronomist. Cause I, I think it's got, you, you have you have watched a lot of episodes live because I, I see on there commenting. Really do appreciate you you tuning in and asking questions, and it's uh, it's a pretty it's a pretty fun show, and obviously not just fun, but also I I, I always learn a lot too. Like I. I always joke with Pete, I'm a pretend wannabe agronomist. There's always things you can pick <laughs> up from the experts that is really so valuable. Yeah, absolutely. It's a uh it's definitely a diamond in a rough there. 
Cool stuff. Well, hey, Warren, thanks so much for joining us here today on the Farm Rapid Fire. All the best to you during harvest, and hopefully these yields hit these expectations that you outlined today. That would be awesome. Oh, I, I, I'm I, optimistic. We've made it to what looks like the coolest nights for this month, so I'm I'm optimistic we, uh, we finished. Just like in sports, with growing crops, finishing strong is important. Well put there. For sure, Warren. Really appreciate your time. Okay, when we come back on Real Ag Radio, we're going to stop in PEI, and then we got one more stop in Eastern Ontario. You're listening to Real Ag Radio, brought to you today by Pioneer Seeds Canada. At Brett Young, we focus on what's real. It's how we became Canada's largest independent seed company. That's why we're asking a real farmer, what do you think of BY6217TF, Brett Young's TrueFlex Canola Hot? What's that? <clears throat> BY6217TF, Brett Young's True Flex Canola Hybrid with Pod Defender Shatter Reduction Technology and Defender Rated Club Root and Black Leg Resistance. Uh, good yield, yeah. Probably choose it again. Thanks, Chris. Talk to your Brett Young retailer today to see for yourself. Brett Young, distinct by design. Boron is an essential micronutrient for plant growth. And without boron, your crops can't absorb the macronutrients they need for higher yields. Although borates occur naturally, boron deficiency is a common soil problem. Whether in direct soil application, through fertigation, or as a foliar spray, U.S. Borax has the right refined product for your crops. U.S. Borax products are specifically formulated to combine with other fertilizers, lowering your application costs. Learn more at borax.com slash egg. And we take the Farmer Rapid Fire brought to you by Pioneer Seeds Canada to Belmont, Prince Edward Island. And we're talking to Ryan Barrett. Hey, Ryan, how's it going? Great, John. How are you? Pretty good. Okay, what's happening on the island this week? What's happening on the farm? Well, it uh, would be great if it would stop raining. Oh, man. So, uh, yeah, so we're... Um, we're into a fair stretch of, uh, it's been pretty rainy here now for a couple of weeks. And, uh, they were saying that we were going to have a, uh, a dry stretch now at the end of this week, but it wasn't supposed to rain today, but it's been kind of misting and showering all day. And we're just really waiting for the, for mother nature to turn off the tap here. So that's, that's kind of where we're at. Now, this has been th- this high level of moisture. This has been kind of a thing all season, has it not? This has been the wettest growing season on record in TEI <laughs> since they started taking records back in the 1800s. And uh, I had a potato grower tell me this morning that he has a field that he has a gauge in uh, that he's had 30 inches of rain since uh, the start of the growing season in that field. Wow. So, um, so we're in some places we're at like near on double rainfall in the, you know, over the summer. Um, so, you know, the, for some crops, that's not a big problem for other crops. It's been a challenge at our, at the home farm. It's meant that we've been able to keep the pastures going all summer and all like into the fall and everything's green and we had a great crop of hay and, um, we were able, we had enough windows, we were able to make all the silage and make all the hay and, we even made a third cut of alfalfa on some fields. We don't normally do that. And so on that side, it hasn't been too bad. Um, we had a lot of challenges with grains. So we had a lot of our barley um, get turned down for John and uh, go through crop insurance. Um, a lot of other people the same. I, I know guys that had to mow down or, or flail chop hundreds of acres of wheat and barley because it failed for dawn and there was no market for it. So mm. there's, there's lots of, there's lots of uh, wheat and barley that aren't, that ha- haven't even been dealt with yet just because they know that it's not going to be pretty. Um, so yeah, we're, there's some guys going to be short on grain here for feed and cattle, I'd say. I'm going to be bringing it in from elsewhere. Um, so that's a definite challenge. We're, we're hoping to start, corn silage sooner than later but maybe next week if things work but i mean the ground's just saturated right now and uh we need it to dry up a little bit just for getting in the fields and getting things done so that's kind of the hope here if it if it dries out here at the end of this week and into next week we we really don't need another drop of rain for the rest of the 
for the rest of the fall. Like that would be awesome. Uh, we can't of course dial it in. We, we got fortunate because we had hurricane Lee come through here last weekend and we only got about an inch of rain out of that. And they were saying that we were going to get two or three. So we were fortunate that way, but we got another inch of rain on the Thursday before the hurricane. And we've got another inch of rain since. So it just, yeah, it just seems to keep coming. What's the expectations of potato yields? Um, it's variable. I would say overall on the island, we're probably looking at an average to a slightly above average yield. Um, again, you'd rather more more moisture than not enough when it comes to potatoes, but we got some parts of the island where they've gotten big rains, especially where they've gotten two, three inches at a time, multiple times in, in succession where the ground hasn't been able to drain fast enough and then there's standing water in the field and then uh, standing water in the rows leads to um, tuber uh, rot and soft rot and all sorts of things like that. So we, I'm already talking to a few guys that are seeing a little bit of rot showing up in some of the potatoes um, in some of the early digs. Now, the stuff that gets dug in two weeks from now in October, well, will some of that stuff have enough time to break down and not be an issue by the time they uh, go to dig and not take it into the storage? That that's going to be the big, uh, the big question. So I know already a lot of people are talking about like not digging their sprayer tracks and not digging their any wet spots and flagging anything that's in the least way problematic and either dig, not digging it at all or digging it last and you know, putting it in temporary storage and trying to get clear of it early so it doesn't become a storage issue. Um, but it, I'd say overall, we're probably looking at a a, a decent year uh, yield, like not quite as good as last year, but still pretty good. I'd still, still probably above average. Um, but uh, yeah, definitely, I'd say it's going to be a complicated storage year this year, likely. Yeah. So. How, with potatoes, how wide is the harvest window in, in the sense of, okay, we can dig, like, but how long can those ready harvest ready potatoes sit in the ground before you start to worry about issues with digging? Yeah. Well, we're a little more fortunate in PEI than some places. So like, you know, Alberta and, and Manitoba are already going great guns. And I'd say I was talking to a guy there in Alberta yesterday and he, they're half done. And I'd say a lot of people in Manitoba are half done. We're, you know, we're just barely getting started here and, most people haven't haven't turned a wheel yet when it comes to harvest, but we're, you know, I'd say most people will start next week, uh, end the next week if the weather's good, and then we can, in a good year we can dig up to Halloween usually. Um, a lot of guys will finish by the third week of October. That's a, like sec, you know, second third week of October, but it just depends on you know how much what their acreage is and whether it's stuff that's going into long-term storage or, you know, just going to the fields, straight to the plant or whatever. Um, but uh, yeah, we have a little longer window than some places because the water around PEI usually means that it keeps it a little warmer, a little longer here in the fall. We're a little, a little slower to warm up in the spring and a little uh, slower to cool down in the fall. So um now, you know, last year you could have dug potatoes probably till the 15th of November, but everybody was cleaned up by then. So yeah, it's, yeah. Uh, we'll just see, see what the weather's like this year. And how are things on the family dairy farm? Good. Uh, we, we, I think I was talking to you there, you know, a couple of times here in the past, we'd lost our barn in the hurricane last year. Yep. Um, we got that up and rebuilt in March and the cows came home in March and we've been, uh, things are going well now, and uh, we're we're kind of sort of back into hitting the stride. The, we're right now calving a lot of cows here right now, filling filling some extra quota that we had to fill from kind of playing catch up. Uh, and uh, but I'd say things are going pretty well here at the moment, and we're into a big run of heifer calves here at the moment. So trying to find a place to put all these heifers and feed them all, it seems to just keep my dad busy. But um, but yeah, no, we're, I think things are pretty good. As I said, we're just kind of gearing up, hopefully start corn silage next week uh, if we can. And uh, and then once that's done, then we'll roll into grain corn and a few other little odds and ends. Harvest is a busy time on a mixed operation. 
Yeah, sure is. Yeah, it's a busy time all around, and uh, I've got I've got helping out a little bit with the home farm, and then uh, of course the full time gig with the potato board, and we're we're you know I'll be starting I'll be starting to dig my research plots uh, next week, and then uh, in <laughs> about three weeks time I'm getting married, so uh, we got uh, that coming up too. <laughs> so, wow, uh, lots uh, lots on the go. Oh, that's awesome. Well, congratulations to you, Ryan. Hey, Ryan, thanks so much for joining us here today. Really appreciate it. And all the best to you here as you work yourself through harvest. All right. Thanks a lot, Sean. And we finish up this week's Farmer Rapid Fire talking to the sponsor of the show. It is Pioneer Seeds Canada. And we're joined right now by Mark Mazenuv. He is in the Ottawa area. He's a territory manager and crop protection specialist with Corteva. Mark, welcome to the show. How are you? Oh, Thanks for uh, the invite. Great. Yeah, well, hey, great to have you here. Okay, uh, how do uh, how do how do those corn and beans look in your area right now? They look actually quite good. I mean, there's certainly areas that were dry for prolonged periods beginning in June, and uh, and uh, they were really looking for more moisture going through the season. But those became real small pockets, and in the end, July and August uh, ended up being fairly high levels of rainfall and uh, really good for uh, product, uh, pollination in corn. Um, some big yields on the horizon and some decent kernel weight, uh, as well as the soybeans, of course, uh, really got quite heavy from a vegetative stage into the reproductive stages. Of course, dealing with white mold and managing that and finding that, you know, in some cases we had higher populations than needed would have been probably better to lower some of those populations. But again, by far a record year, in, in, at least in the t- 20 years that I spent in eastern Canada and 10 out west, uh, this is by far the heaviest pressure we've ever had for uh, for in Denmark in soybeans. So if anything, we're going to see some really good yields um, and some uh, our, our fungicide products have, have fared quite well um, despite you know some heavy pressure. We're going to see some strong yield protection and higher higher uh, expectations, I'm sure, uh, going forward. Uh, opposite some learnings this year uh, with the white mold pressure. Yeah, and very similar message we've been hearing from, from growers in Ontario here over the past few weeks in the Farmer Rapid Fire. I know we were talking during the commercial break. You were mentioning that you know right now a lot of discussions in, in your role at Corteva, uh, obviously about weed control. And you know this this of uh, how we've seen ev- evolving strategies when it comes to flea bane, water hemp. We identified Palmer amaranth in in Ontario, which is not great news. Uh, talk about what you've been what message you've been giving to growers. Yeah, that's definitely correct. Uh, we we've, we've ha- had the evolution of the wheat spectrum move from the southwest to the northeast uh, as you go into eastern Ontario into Quebec as well. Um, most of the discussions were around, you know, resistance to uh, the group two chemistry and uh, when it came to the amaranth family or most of the pigweed. Uh, then, of course, triazines and, and uh, the lamb quarters. Now we've kind of gone to that next stage in evolution and using the multi-modes of action that we have uh, dealing with Canada flea bane. Probably at, the, at least a 10-year-old story for Western Ontario, but more recent in Eastern Ontario. And hot off the press would be the infestations of water hemp that we're now seeing in eastern Ontario. Uh, that kind of took it from took us from kind of a watch to uh, a, a, a more than <laughs> more than watch uh, red zone in some cases as far as management goes, and not relying uniquely on on glyphosate. If anything, we're looking more at what's coming this fall and uh, from our combine windows, and I think we'll be quite surprised in some cases how much water hemp there is out there. Uh, certainly the Canada flea bane, we've had it on the radar and we've been managing that with some burn down and pre-emergent mixes as well as post-emergent uh, and especially in our soybean systems, we've had a lot of success uh, in, in talking about it, understanding it and not just relying on two applications of life state. With water hemp, it's that much more of a, of a, a story um, and that it's amplified the importance of different modes of action and tank mixing uh, at different times of the uh, season. So in the burn down, you know, mixing our group 
fourteens and and fives, and you know, adding on to that Glyph State piece uh, in the pre-emergent window too, with you know fives and fifteens as far as grass residual and residual from for for broadleaf in crop. Uh, there's obviously going to be a couple lanes there with the use of dicamba early in the season uh, to you know work within its limitations, and then of course the post-emergent window with uh, the enlist system that is fit pretty much in the early post uh, window, either tank mix with life state. And we're still getting very high levels of efficacy, even with our traditional Roundup Ready 2 type tank mixes, whether it was life state and, fr- and freestyle, for example. But more and more as we go into the uh, the enlist system, there'll be tank mixing um, with Liberty uh, for water hemp and ensuring that there's a bit more of a program approach in having a uh, group 15 uh, uh chemistry down uh, that is combined with the whole strategy of using your 14s and 15s and group nines uh, tank mixed with, um, you know, per, perhaps still some group twos, but more and more some of these group fours. And we're seeing that in the rotation uh, with, with corn two and in our managing our group 27 uh, and uh, the, the group four, the additions of, of, of things like, uh, uh, of lot Lontrell for Canada flavoring, but of course the uh, uh, kind of the com- co- commit co- combinations we've had too of Callisto and and atrazine, uh in corn. So that importance of rotation, uh, obviously of the crops, but also of the chemistries in different windows of application throughout the season um, is going to be that much more important. Identifying it is is the beginning, and uh, and then and having some strategies to go um, and and manage it. All all co- uh, quarters of the season will be that much more important. Yeah, and, and trying to keep all these yeah. groups and strategies straight, <laughs> I, it kind of makes my head spin a little bit. Yeah, it, the the importance of documentation, uh, field mapping, and and really documentation as far as what seeds are planted where. Um, that much more emphasis on probably going more one system versus. A multitude of systems on your farm, uh, but again, targeting certain weeds um, and and the timing will be will be important. Uh, certainly, we work and tend to work more with the enlist system, and there's a lot of flexibility in that uh, system, whether it's tank mixes in the burn down or or pre emergent window, followed by some post applications. Uh, in eastern Ontario, we're already working with uh, you know enlist uh, to to bring our horse tail populations down, and at times. Uh, tank mixing with our fungicide in uh, the uh, the flowering window or the early flowering window as well, sort of R1.5 to R2, because that also happens to be our our first uh, line of attack uh, with the fungicides in, uh, in in soybeans. And that that will be important to document as well, you know, rotate our chemistry, but also in, in trying to rotate our, our, uh, our windows of opportunity because a lot of these emerging weeds are very prolific in their seed production and uh, you can't you can't leave the door open uh, for them to establish either uh, you know movement from uh, a variety of sources but uh, especially within the field be it, be it machine, machinery moving from one field to the other um, we've got bird populations we've got wind we've got everything sort of coming at us to you know propel the the wheat seed uh, into neighboring fields um so it's uh, going to be a multi-tactical approach to to stay on top of it well mark really appreciate you joining us here today on the farmer rapid fire brought to you by pioneer seeds canada thanks so much really appreciate it um a pleasure and uh wish everyone a, a really good and safe harvest thank you that was a lot of fun today here today on the Farmer Rapid Fire. Remember to go to pioneer.com slash Canada to find out more about some of the great products that Pioneer has available to fit your farm. If you have any feedback on today's show, send me an email, shaney at realagriculture.com. You can also, of course, call the Real Ag Feedback Line, 855-776-6147. Thanks, everybody, for getting real and getting connected with Real Ag Radio. And we'll, of course, chat again tomorrow. Cheers, everybody. Cheers, everybody.